Hi there. Hi, uh, welcome to Earth Live Lesson. Thanks so much for having me on here, Lizzie. My name is Kareem Ilya, and I'm an underwater photographer and filmmaker, drone pilot. I specialize in wildlife and um, photographing nature, particularly um, in, in the world of humpback whales. So I have here to show you this photo. Oh, there's a bit of a reflection there, but um, this here is the eye of a humpback whale. Now, um, what I want to talk about today is uh, swimming with these large animals and um, interacting with different species in the ocean and, and how that can differ from interacting with species on land and what that means as far as ocean conservation and how that can have a, a, a behavior effect on these animals when you are um, interacting in their space. As we know, um, you know, being in nature, it can be a delicate thing. A lot of animals are quite sensitive to interacting with humans and we are a noisy species. We bring quite a bit of, um, quite a bit of, uh, let me start again. So I run these trips in uh, places like Tonga and French Polynesia to, to take people swimming with humpback whales. And what I found is it's a two-sided thing. On one hand, it can be the fastest way to connect people up with the ocean. As humans, we have such a disconnect with the um, the ocean and, and the, the animals that are inside it and how our behaviors might affect um, the ecosystem. Everything we do on land has an effect. And most people are, their interaction with the ocean is very limited to either snorkeling on it on the maximum and um, on the minimum, there's a lot of people who don't even have access to the ocean. So what does it mean to get in the water with these with these animals, like sea lions, um, watching feeding behavior, such as marlins hunting, um, or getting in the water with, with large animals like humpback whales? Now, um, a lot of these species are, are very intelligent and they they are aware of your presence. Now, if you if you take time and you go slowly and, and groups are kept small then um, there is a way I've found in which you can interact with these animals um, or passively watch them. So I'm gonna show you a, a few photos just to, to get started um, of my work with, with humpback whales and, and different marine species and documenting them. Might be a bit of a reflection since I'm on an iPad, but um, this here is a uh, humpback whale calf. Now, um, every year, humpback whales, there's a few different populations, and they'll go through to um, the South Pacific population, which feeds off of Antarctica, will make their way uh, up to islands in the South Pacific in order to have their calves. And um, while they're there, they will socialize, they will, uh, they will mate, they will battle for mating partners and um, and then they'll have their calves. They, their gestation period is about one year, um, maybe a little less. I'm not quite sure exactly on, on the number on that, but essentially they have their calves and, and mother humpback whales, the best way to think about it is they are about the size of a bus, right? This is a huge, huge animal and on land you, it might be hard to imagine getting so close to such a large animal for starters, you know, getting, being out of a safari vehicle, if you're with an elephant would be quite an ordeal. Um, but these marine mammals, they're highly intelligent, they're highly curious. And um, oftentimes if you move slowly and quietly and in small numbers, these mothers, once they have their calves, they'll actually let their calves come up right up close and play with you. Um, these calves just for scale are 
oftentimes about the size of a car uh, when they when they come out. And um, let me see if I can pull up another one here. They will even swim under you at times and open their fins up. Here we go. I have one right here showing a, um, a humpback whale calf. Sorry. So this calf um, swam swam under me and essentially opened its fins up. And I looked around and I saw behind me, in front of me, all there was is, is this whale. Now this is a, an active interaction with this animal. Um, there's other interactions that you might have in the water where with a younger calf, where you just sit back and watch. And this is something that um, is for me also one of the most beautiful things to witness. And um, here's an example of that where you have this, um, this mother whale lifting her calf up to the surface to help it breathe. And um, in the background, you can see this what's called an escort whale. Uh, this is, there's other types of interactions. Sometimes they pass by very quickly. Um, here in this one, I will show you. Um, one of the things I find interesting about interacting with many different marine mammals. This is during a heat run where essentially, I'll show this photo in, in another moment, but essentially you have um, a female that is in heat ready to mate and she will start this um, startup. It, basically a, it's called a competition pod or heat run where males will come in from different areas and they will start to fight with each other she may be moving at high speeds, turning, maneuvering, and these males will follow along and essentially try and keep up with her and keep the other males away. And what ends up happening is they they smash into each other. You can hear them trumpeting. You, you see bubbles blowing. And um, it, it's an incredible thing to witness. And the first time I saw this underwater, I couldn't imagine ever that it would be even be possible to get in the water with these animals. Can you imagine getting out of a vehicle and getting right up near polar bears fighting with each other? It would be um, it would be insane. You, it would be dangerous and it would be insane. Uh, humpback whales, on the other hand, are very spatially aware, and so when you're in the water, they'll actually. Um, you know, if they need to, I found whales that have made adjustments with their fins to just buzz over you or under you to avoid you. Now, this this is a comes with the double edged sword. The the two sides of it is how do your interactions with these animals affect their behavior? My goal in the water is always to uh, minimize disturbance, minimize change in behavior. Um, as a wildlife photographer. It's this balance between trying to tell a story, trying to get a shot, but also uh, not, you know, change the behavior of the animals. And um, it, it, it's a it's a constant balance that that we strive for in the water, and that I'm always working towards. Um, but ultimately, um, I found that getting people face to face with these animals and um, showing these stories, it can have an impact that helps people to care about these animals. And you never know who you might affect. Um, you know, it's for me, I think about how important it is with the younger generation to get them interested in protecting and preserving all of our ecosystems on this planet, because we're, we live in a, in a, a place where as humans, there's a lot of us and we consume a lot of resources, myself included. And so how can we get people to have a vested interest in these, a space that is often out of sight, out of mind, overlooked and with, with things like pollution, plastics going in the ocean, um, I found that connecting people with marine animals um, is a powerful way to get them to care about this this planet as a whole. Um, there are other 
marine animals that are highly interactive as well. And I found that um, whereas on land, it is much more of a, a passive thing that you you watch these animals underwater. It's not just whales that will come right up, up to you and um, for for an interaction. And one of the, for me, one of the most profound moments actually happened just a few months ago. So this was my first day in the water. I was out in Mexico to, to document striped marlin and sea lions hunting. And um, a, a friend of mine and I, his name is Sebastian, he, we, we got off the boat because there was a, a sea lion. The sea lion was popping its head out of the water, curious what we were doing on the boat. And so we got in to sea. And um, I don't even know how long, how much time went by as we played with this, this sea lion out in the deep blue. And um, in this moment here, the, the two of them, Sebastian and the sea lion, they were hovering there, suspended, watching each other. And it, it, it felt timeless. They just looked at each other and um, both with the same kind of curiosity. And when I, when I saw this, and I've seen this a few times in nature, where you have an animal and a human that meet each other at the same level to, to really have this, um, this interaction where it's, it feels like a very mutual thing. Uh, that to me is a powerful, powerful moment. And here's another, another, uh, actually this might've been the same sea lion coming up and blowing bubbles out of its mouth. And, um, a week later, I was with uh, two friends and we were out on the boat and it was a sunny day and we came across a huge group, uh, a huge uh, group of sea lions that out in the, in the deep blue, far away from any, um, any land, you could hardly see the mountains in the distance. And when I first got in the water, they were a little bit shy. They would, they would come up to the edge of visibility and then they would turn and go and then they would come back. And um, in the end, there were about 70 to 100 sea lions. If you have a look, you can see all these sea lions. And they were just cir circling around the three of us. I would dive down and they would come and blow bubbles and play. And at one point, I went back to the boat to, uh, to, to swap cameras. And about 20 or 30 sea lions followed me to the boat waited while I swapped my camera and then followed me back. And, and to me, this was one of the most profound experiences to see. These are animals that are out looking for food, socializing, and here they've, they've stopped and eventually spent an hour and a half or so with us uh, just to play, just to interact. So I think we often don't give enough credit to animals um, that in that they can meet us on a mutual level and if we if we give them a bit of space we don't overcrowd them we give them some respect then we can make this connection with nature that we have oftentimes lost living in the cities building houses where we have all of the elements at our disposal you know you turn on the tap you have got water you flip a switch you've got light you turn a, a nozzle and you have fire and it's very easy to say, this is my space, and we keep the animals out there, out there in the distance. Um, but the reality is we still have this connection with nature. And so I'm constantly trying to explore the balance between how ecotourism and um, getting people connected to nature, how that can have a better impact in the long run on our planet while trying to minimize the disturbance like what are the positives that can be gained from that and and how can that be used as a tool to to connect people to essentially uh, protect and preserve these ecosystems and animals so that they'll be around for you know many more generations and and even longer if than than ourselves and what we can think um, I, I see that there's a few questions 
on the side. So I'm going to um, have a look and answer those. Do different species, this is, says from K Bevan on Instagram, do different species of whale behave differently in the water? Yes, um, absolutely. Humpback whales are one of the most social whales and um, they're very curious. There are other whale species that are, are less social. Um, for example, I had the opportunity to free dive with a blue whale mother and calf. It was the, the first time I'd ever seen a blue whale above water, below water, just in general. And the very first time that I got in the water, it was a blue whale mother and, and her calf. And um, they, as they moved along, they turned a, a quarter of a rotation and they looked up at us. It was, it was just three of us uh, or two, two of us in the water actually. And they turned and they looked up at us and, um, it made me think of somebody, it made me think of a bus or a train that's passing by. And, um, you know, you, you might have people on the bus or the train that look at you and wave at you and they're curious, but they continue along their way. And, and I've, this is what I found, um, with my minimal, interactions with blue whales and from what i know with other people's interactions with blue whales is that um they'll, they'll they may be curious and they may look at you but they typically will continue along and keep moving and keep doing what they're doing um, humpbacks on the other hand are very social they'll, they'll be stationary sometimes they'll be moving sometimes they'll swim around you and play with you um i've seen uh whales interacting with dolphins too. I got to free dive with uh, a fin whale and uh, it had common dolphins around it. And the dolphins were playing and, and swimming. So that was that was really interesting. The um, While humpbacks function more as these very small units and will temporarily get together for mating competitions or, or socialization, or mostly restricted to mother calf, other other species, um, orcas, for example, uh, I'm not sure how they classify exactly as whales. We'll just say cetate. We'll just use cetaceans uh, in this case, but um, orcas, dolphins, things like that function more um, in a pod um, where where it's a, a social group that communicates. And so, um, just like people. Whales have different, there's different personalities, there's different moods. Um, there are some whales that have no interest in interacting, and there's other whales that are very interested in it. And I like to think of it as being as if you're on the subway, you know, or the bus. There might be somebody who wants to talk to you and wants to interact and have a conversation, but then there's other people who, who don't. And generally speaking, <laughs> if somebody doesn't want to interact with you, then you should leave them alone. And it's the same kind of deal with the whales. And so I always try and go and find the whales that are interested in interacting. You know, if they're not interested in the boat, if they're not interested in us being in the water, then we leave and we go find whales. And if we don't find whales that day, then it's absolutely fine. Um, you know, nature is not a, it's not a guaranteed thing interacting and swimming with these animals. It really takes a lot of time and a lot of patience to get just a few moments um, of interaction. And then when you do, I mean, then you get moments like this where you have, you know, a whale and it's looking into your eye. And when you've got, when you've got a whale looking into your eye, I know it's a, a very cliche thing to say, but it's, it's such a powerful experience and you really can connect with the animal and, um, on a whole different level and realize that there's something more there. And I understand that um, it's such a, you know, swimming with whales is, is not accessible to most of the world's population. And so that's why, you know, I really try and, and document these animals so that I can share that with all of the people who, who don't have a chance to do this. Um, so that, you know, hopefully through my photography and through my video that, people can connect up with these animals and um, and get a sense of what their life is like beneath the surface. 
Um, another question from the audience. Are there any individual whales that you've gotten to know over the years? Uh, unfortunately, I have not managed to get to know um, any specific whale over the years. I have interacted with the same whale over the course of a few days. And that that's that's a really special thing. And, and you can see that different days, they have different different moods. Sometimes they're more social. Sometimes it's more of a passive thing. Sometimes they don't want to interact. And so you just leave them be. Um, I do, I, I would like to um, document and interact with a single whale over the years. But the luckily, the, um, the humpback whale population, it's a uh, quite a success story in in terms of conservation goes and the numbers have really rebounded um, quite well and what that means is where i typically work in the um, south pacific there are hundreds of islands that these whales go to and it, it they won't go you know from antarctica and come up to one island and be there the whole season they'll they'll be there for a week or two weeks or a little while and then move on even with their calves. And so you're constantly, if you're there for the whole season, you're constantly getting this rotation of whales coming through. So they leave and then a new batch comes through and then they leave and a new batch comes through and leaves. So, um, you, you know, they're such large creatures that are capable of traversing long distances through the ocean that um, it's quite difficult to, to track them and to to stay with them i mean in the end um we have to go back to shore and so i have never been able to to do that but it is something that i hope to and plan on doing in the future um, another question have you seen any changes in behavior during this pandemic i have not been able to um get much in the water with whales uh during the pandemic i i did i did have an opportunity to do so um, however, where, where it was that I was able to, um, get in the water with them, there were a lot of other people there. So, uh, I did not see any behavioral changes in that regard. However, here, um, in Maui, where I am for a period of time, um, there were, we were, we were not open to tourism. We were in, in lockdown and what that meant that is that the seas were much quieter. I'm sure that had an impact on the whales because they are very sensitive to noise. They do communicate with sound. And so having quieter oceans for an animal like humpback whales um, and other whale species, I'm sure has actually been quite, um, I'm sure it has been has been a benefit. Now, it's a difficult topic, I'm, and I don't have the expertise to talk on how the oceans as a whole have fared uh, during the pandemic, but um, it is an interesting thing to explore. And, um, you know, I, I'd like to think that on one hand, the whales in the, the South Pacific, in places like Tonga, where, where I typically run my trips, that they've enjoyed a nice year, a nice season without any humans. Um, but I also wonder, you know, maybe some of them, uh, maybe some of them were looking forward to interacting with us. I also sometimes think about how, you know, these these humpback whale calves are, are born and um, some of them, their early interactions are with other whales and with dolphins and and sometimes humans and how does that shape them and one of the most profound moments actually that i've i've had in the water i've been in the water with humpbacks for hundreds of hours and uh, there was one particular moment that really stands out to me that um sh just showed me how how intelligent these these animals can be and and how aware they are is um there was there was this calf that was it was very shy you know when you have mothers and calves you can have uh, mothers that are very relaxed and calves that are very playful and really excited sometimes you have these mothers that have to rein their calves back in and, and kind of mellow them out um, and then other times you have these calves that are very shy 
And this calf in particular was very shy. And every time it would go up to breathe, it would go up on the other side to breathe and it would swim away um, to the other side of the mother. And at one point, the mothers will typically spend 20 minutes down before they come up to breathe. And at one point, the calf went up, would have been the, the second or third time, the calf went up to breathe. The mother started to come up and with the front of her face, we'll call it, pushed the calf's tail, rotated it around and brought it so that the calf was between us and the mother. And um, these animals will, will, you know, they're very aware of which side they put their calf on, where they want you, where they want their calf. And so seeing this mother whale, which had clearly interacted with humans throughout the years, seeing her basically push her calf up towards us, pushing it and then placing herself at the surface between um, with the calf between us and her was it, it was such a powerful moment because I was thinking here is this mother that is basically showing her calf you know here are these humans go and you know you can it's okay to go and interact with them now of course some of this I may be projecting my own um, personal human traits on this and and um, but that is is very much what it felt like. And o over time, I have seen behaviors like this where, you know, animals will come up to interact with you on their own accord. And, and you know, with the sea lions, for example, oftentimes when you get back on the boat, they pop their head out and as if they're just waiting for you to come back in the water. And when you leave, they it almost feels as if they're disappointed. So... Um, thank you so much for having me and for listening and 